Hello and welcome to another Coding Secrets. This is the first time people have been able to use the Game Hut website to vote on what topic I should cover, and this time, by the narrowest of margins, I'll be explaining how we made the Sega Genesis produce multi-channel sampled music. First, let's have a listen to the music in question. As you can hear, it's quite unlike other music on the console. The Sega Genesis has only one channel capable of playing samples, called the PCM channel, and it's extremely limited in what it can do. It doesn't even have a volume setting. The Commodore Amiga, on the other hand, has an excellent four-channel audio chip, capable of some amazing sample-based music, and so we thought it would be fun to see if we could get Amiga music playing on the Sega Genesis. To find out how we did it, first we should take a look inside. Looking closely inside, we can see the three main chips I'll be talking about. The 68000 main microprocessor, the Yamaha sound chip and the Z80 processor. The Z80 processor is connected up directly to the sound chip, and for games it handles playing the music. To play samples it has to very quickly read from its memory and blast data directly to a thing called the DAC, a digital to analogue converter on the sound chip. If it does this fast enough, you get a reasonable sounding sample. Now, the Z80 memory is pretty small, just 8K for everything it needs, but if a game uses any samples, they will usually fit them all into the Z80 memory, because if they don't, it gets very messy, as you'll see. Typically, samples are used just for a drum track, if at all. But with what we're trying to do, we need a lot more memory to play with than the Z80 has. Now, the 68000 main processor can copy from its own memory to the Z80's memory, but there is a catch. To do this, it has to stop the Z80 accessing memory at the same time, and if it does that, the Z80 will stop playing the sample, meaning everything will fall silent during the memory transfer, which is obviously pretty bad when you're trying to play music. So to get around this, we decided to send a tiny amount of data extremely often, so instead of the music stopping, it would just pause for a tiny fraction of time, resulting in just a slight quality loss that's not really noticeable at the sample rates we are playing with. The blue lines on this screen are horizontal interrupts. This means that on each of those lines, as the screen is being drawn, we copy around 10 bytes of data to the Z80's memory. Over a frame we do this 15 to 20 times, meaning over a second we copy around 10,000 bytes to the Z80, resulting in a playback sample rate of around 10 kHz. Not great, but not unusable. However, we quickly hit another problem. The Z80 could be reading from our shared sample memory before we finished writing to it. So to solve this, we have to double buffer the sample memory. So we can be writing new data to one buffer in memory, whilst the Z80 is reading from what we finished with in the other buffer. So that's a lot of work already, but all that's done is increase the amount of memory available to play a sample from. How does that give us more sample channels? Well now we have access to the 68000's memory, we can use the main processor's grunt to start doing some real-time maths to help us out. Here's two sample waveforms displayed visually. If we zoom in closely, we can see that a sound sample is actually just a series of evenly spaced dots joined together by lines. In fact, all a sound sample is, unsurprisingly, is a list of numbers. So if we want to play two samples at the same time, all we need to do is add the two lists of numbers together. If you compare both these graphs on the same screen, it very much looks as though the top one is just the sum of the bottom two. Now, in fact, the program that did this applies a pretty complex and slow algorithm to get the best results. But for a quick and dirty solution, all you have to do is halve the value of each of the samples and add them together. The result is half the volume, but both samples combined as one. But playing music is much more than just adding two samples together. Samples have to play at different pitches and volumes to each other as well. So how do we change the pitch of just one of the samples? Well, if we double the pitch of this sample, we can see that we've just deleted every other number. So to play at twice the pitch, we skip every other number. To play at 50% higher pitch, we skip every third number, and so on. So let's look at what the sample goes through once it's been requested by the music playing program. First we use a pitch table to determine which byte of the sample we're currently interested in, using it to skip over bytes that aren't needed at this pitch. Then we use a volume table to scale our sample byte down in size if it needs to play at a lower volume. For example, if the byte starts life as the number 20 and needs to be played at half volume, the table tells it to become the number 10 instead. 
then the byte is stored in the channel buffer while the sound code goes through the same process for three more channels. Next, all four channels are added together mathematically as discussed earlier, and this is repeated a set number of times to fill up the 68,000 buffer with a certain length of audio ready to go. We then swap buffers and start building our next audio whilst the first lot is sent off in tiny pieces to the Z80 memory. And that's how it all works, very roughly. Pretty in-depth and technical this one, but I hope it made some sense to some of you, and I look forward to sharing more secrets with you next time.